Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Advancing Parkinson's Disease Cell Therapy, Transplanting Cryopreserved iPSC-Derived Neurons, that will be presented by Dr. Dustin Wakeman. We're excited to bring to you this educational webinar uh, presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Cellular Dynamics International. Cellular Dynamics International is a Fujifilm company um, is a Fujifilm Fuji company and is the world's largest producer of human iPS cells and human iPS cell derived cell types. Their growing product offering includes the iCell products, which are cells that are differentiated from healthy donors, such as the iCell neurons, iCell cardiomyocytes, etc., and the MyCell products that uh, provide reprogramming, genetic engineering, and differentiation services from your choice of patient samples. These cells are currently being used in drug discovery, toxicity testing, stem cell banking, and cell therapy, um, or cell therapy development. To learn more about cellular dynamics, please visit www.cellulardynamics.com. I am Susan DeLora, and I'm from Cellular Dynamics, and I'll be the moderator for the event today. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone that this is an interactive event, and so therefore I encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time throughout the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button that's located in the lower uh, corner of the presentation window and type your question in the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can uh, at the end of the presentation. Also, the presentation will be viewed in the slide window, and you can enlarge that window just by clicking on the screen icon that is located on the lower right corner. Finally, if you have any problems seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you are having a problem. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dustin Wakeman. Uh, Dr. Wakeman is an assistant professor at Rush University Medical Center, where his research goals are directed at determining the long-term value of stem cell-based uh, therapeutics in neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative diseases. Dr. Wakeman's research is primarily focused on preclinical testing of dopamine neurons for dopamine replacement therapy using a rational course of animal models to predict translational clinical outcomes. His lab is also utilizing pluripotent stem cells to develop new strategies for modeling disorders of the central nervous system. Their goal is to use patient-derived iPSCs as an in vitro platform to model disease-specific phenotypes and develop new druggable targets, as well as using in, in vivo studies to mimic human disease, human disease in the rodent and non-human primate brains. Dr. Wakeman received his BS in biology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and then completed his PhD in biomedical sciences at the University of California at San Diego. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wakeman. I'll now turn the presentation over to him. Well, thank you, Sue, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to Cellular Dynamics International and LabRoots for sponsoring this talk. And as Sue mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you today about our work utilizing pluripotent stem cells as a potential therapy for Parkinson's disease. So a quick uh, disclosure, I am a consultant and recipient of research funding from CDI, uh, which is work I will show you today. So I have three uh, main learning objectives today. First is to distinguish between the different types of cell-based therapeutics for Parkinson's disease. Second will be to actually define what an authentic midbrain lineage dopamine neuron actually is. And then third, uh, we'll be able to identify key components for a successful pluripotent stem cell-based clinical trial for Parkinson's disease. But first, what is Parkinson's disease? Well, Parkinson's disease is uh, anatomically uh, characterized by a specific degeneration of dopaminergic neurons within the uh, substantia nigra, uh, that is uh, deep in the midbrain of, of your brain. And uh, you can see in the bottom right here, uh, in a Parkinson's disease patient, you literally have a loss of these black substance uh, neurons. 
And uh, these neurons actually project fibers or axons into the striatum, both the caudate and putamen, uh, which is where the dopaminergic transmission actually takes place. So when we have degeneration of these neurons, we get the characteristic uh, clinical symptoms of Parkinson's disease, things like tremor, rigidity, postural instability that you've all heard of. Uh, and again, this is a stem cell talk, so I just want to sort of characterize the different types of cells that I'm going to be talking about today. Now, at sort of the hierarchy of the stem cell, uh, we have the uh, embryonic stem cells and IPS cells and used pluripotent stem cells. So these cells are pluripotent, and what that means is that they can give rise to any cell type in the body. So we're talking about heart cells, skin cells, and in our case today, we'll be talking about neurons, specifically dopamine neurons. Now, if we take those cells and we sort of coax them in uh, the neural lineage, uh, we get what we call the neural stem cell. That cell is multipotent. And what we mean by that is it can, and at least in the case of the CNS, the central nervous system, they can make astrocytes or like adenocytes uh, and neurons. Now, these cell types have a unique characteristic in that they can suffer new. So we can make a large number of these cells from a small population. Now, if we take those cells and we further differentiate them, we get what's called a lineage-restricted neuroblast, and then we can actually move that cell towards a dopaminergic neuron or fully differentiated postmitotic neuron. So these cell types are, as I mentioned, postmitotic. So the number you start with is the number you have at the end. So really, the beauty of stem cells, at least from a regenerative medicine standpoint, is that they have the capacity to both self-renew, so we can make a whole bunch of them from a small population. We can actually differentiate them into very specific cell types uh, that we'd like to use for therapy. Now, this concept of using neural cells for transplantation in Parkinson's disease is by no means a, a new field. This has been going on for over 30 years. And the first cell type that really gained traction and even made it into clinical trials and showed some clinical efficacy in open label trials was the cell we call the fetal ventromus encephalon. So the fetal VM is the area of midbrain in the fetus uh, where those dopamine neurons are born and will eventually degenerate during um, the Parkinson's disease degenerative process. Now, as I mentioned, there were some uh, positive outcomes of these trials. However, the main issue here is that uh, it takes about one to eight fetuses to treat an individual patient. So it's extremely hard to source that type of tissue and the tissue itself is somewhat heterogeneous. So remembering our, our sort of our hierarchy our, our lineages we just talked about, the next obvious step is say, well, maybe we can use the dopaminergic neuroblast. Uh, and that also has shown uh, some success in, in animal models. Uh, however, again, we still have, we're sort of plagued with this problem where we're still using one fetus to treat an individual patient. So that doesn't get rid of the sourcing issue or the heterogeneity. So if we take a step even further back, uh, I'll be showing you some work today, uh, previous work of mine and colleagues, where we used fetal human neural stem cells. In this case, they were derived from the subventricular zone. And that has the added advantage of you can take one fetus, create a, a neural stem cell line, and you can treat a large number of patients. And then of course we have, the majority of this talk we're talking about our pluripotent stem cells, our ES cells and our IPS cells, where we can make both neural stem cells as well as a full on postmitotic midbrain dopamine neurons. And so really the advantage of these pluripotent stem cells is that they're renewable, right? So we can make as many of them as we need uh, and they're relatively, uh, uh, can make pretty much relatively un unlimited supply. And secondarily, that we can actually make very specific cell types. And again, for the purpose of today's talk, we'll be talking about midbrain dopamine neurons. So back in 2007, uh, we published a paper uh, when I was in Evan Snyder's group where we showed that uh, after transplantation of these neural stem cells, these are human fetal neural stem cells, into the Parkinsonian primate brain, we could actually alleviate behavioral dysfunction. And so we were quite happy to find this. And when we did the histology, what we found were uh, we had these uh, beautiful BRDU positive, TH positive cells. So these were donor cells that were labeled with BRDU and they were TH positive. And what that means is that uh, TH is a tyrosine hydroxylase. It's a rate limiting enzyme in dopamine synthesis. So really throughout the talk today, when I talk about TH, I'm primarily talking about dopamine neurons. So we were quite happy to find these TH positive cells. Unfortunately, when we counted them, there were only about three to 5% of the transplanted cells that actually differentiated. And we started to ask ourselves, is that really enough cells to accommodate this type of functional improvement we saw? And we thought, well, maybe something else is going on here. And in a, uh, subsequent papers, we actually showed that that was probably the case, where about 95% of these cells remained as undifferentiated neural stem cells. And it looked like they were really acting through secondary mechanisms to restore and rescue the endogenous dopamine neurons that had been spared. So at the same time, uh, when I was in Evan Snyder's group, human embryonic stem cells were, were really becoming in vogue. And we had some really good techniques to actually make neural cells. And not just neural cells, we were learning how to make dopamine cells. 
And so uh, basically what I want you to understand here is that whenever uh, we're working with stem cells, really what we're trying to do is model human development, okay? So when I'm trying to make a human dopamine neuron uh, from an embryonic stem cell or an iPS cell, all I'm trying to do is do my best to recapitulate the normal developmental cues that are involved in, in the embryo and in the fetus to actually make these cells. And so uh, you can see here, we had a variety of different morphogens uh, and other chemical factors, and we can actually derive these nesting positive, SOX1 positive neural stem cells. You see they have these nice, what we call rosette structures. And so we were able to make these neural epithelial precursors. You can then add a variety of other differentiation and maturation factors. In this case, uh, things like Wnt proteins, um, sonic hedgehog, and a variety of other um, uh, factors. And we can actually differentiate these cells into uh, uh, primarily, and here we have 95% beta-3 tubulin positive neurons, these are uh, a neuronal marker. And then of these cells, about 17% actually became dopaminergic in their fate. And this was uh, really on par with what other groups were showing uh, in functional improvement in rodent models. So uh, we thought, okay, well, what happens to these cells if we transplant them into our Parkinsonian monkey? And so we did a sort of a proof of concept experiment uh, where I labeled these cells with GFP and we transplanted them into both the striatum as well as into the substantia nigra. And you can see on these two left panels here, we had very nice graph survival. And in the top right panel, these are again beta 3 tubulin positive. Uh, and you can see here in the bottom right panel, they had a very nice large, uh, sort of this neuronal, a large soma, as well as a very extensive fiber innervation. So this was great because we were showing that not only could these uh, human embryonic stem cell derived cells survive, at, uh, but they were also projecting pretty extensive fibers and innervating the host parenchyma. And this is only 28 days post transplantation. Now, unfortunately, when I stained for uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, I found zero cells that were TH positive. So remember, 17% of these cells went in TH positive. So I really started to ask myself, what's going on here? Uh, sort of where did we go wrong? Now, uh, I mentioned previously, and I want to reiterate, uh, as stem cell biologists, all we're really trying to do is understand and recapitulate what's going on during normal development. So really, the best stem cell biologists uh, are really good developmental biologists. And so this is just a, schem a schematic here of the rodent brain uh, uh, very early uh, during development. And really what I wanna focus on here is this midline area where the forebrain and hindbrain meet. Uh, there's a, a, a gradient of sonic hedgehog uh, and a variety of other factors. But if you take a cross section here uh, at the midbrain, uh, and what I want you to focus on is on that right panel there is that little red area there. That's an area called the foreplate. And it turns out that's where these dopaminergic neurons are actually born. And in a series of uh, brilliant experiments and uh, very carefully thought out experiments, Ron Mackay, who's a fantastic developmental biologist, uh, specifically in, in our field for making dopamine neurons, sort of figured out uh, that there's this master regulator, FOXA2, uh, this transcription factor that really does sort of regulate uh, these early dopaminergic progenitors. And so you can see down in the bottom three panels at embryonic day nine and a half, we have a very early expression of the sonic hedgehog uh, and this LMX1B transcription factor. And then you see at 12.5, this is the beginning of those TH positive dopamine neurons. So again, through a series of elegant experiments, he really showed that by knocking this gene out, FOXA2, uh, he could actually induce a Parkinsonian-like uh, symptom. And so uh, what I want you to sort of remember for the rest of this talk is these two genes, these FOXA2, LMX1B, and that these genes really do specify what we call an authentic midbrain lineage foreplay dopaminergic neuron. Okay, so uh, now Ron Mackay had some extremely talented postdocs that have come through his lab, and one of those particular uh, postdocs that came through his lab, and now is just a phenomenal uh, uh, stem cell scientist and developmental biologist, was Lorenz Studer in 2011. Uh, he published this paper in Nature uh, with uh, Sonia Cricks being the first author. And uh, this is uh, uh, both myself and Dr. Jeffrey Cordova at Rush were actually quite fortunate to be able to work with uh, Dr. Studer on this project. And what the Rens basically showed in this paper was that this technique we were using, this rosette based strategy, was completely wrong. And in fact, what we were doing was neuralizing cells towards an actually an anterior neurectoderm fate. And what Lorenz showed was, uh, and again, the specifics here of these chemicals aren't really all that important right now, but I, what I wanna point out is one specific molecule, and that's this green box on the bottom, the CHIR molecule you're seeing, and that's basically a WIN, uh, a win activator. And so what Lorenz showed in this paper was that when you activate canonical WIN signaling, you could actually induce floor plate neurogenesis. And this turned out to be a huge breakthrough and really a paradigm shift for the field. So I'm gonna show you that data now. 
So the focus now again on the top left panel here. There's a floor plate derived dopaminergic neurons, that technique I just showed you. And what we have here is LMX1A FOXA2 expression in these cells. And you can see the old technique, the rosette based uh, technique right below. You only get the TH positive cells, not the LMX1A and FOXA2 expression. Remember, those are those two critical transcription factors that are important uh, in the floor plate where the, mid, where the midbrain dopamine neurons are actually born. And to the right of that, we have TH and NER1. NER1 is another one of these uh, pro-dopaminergic genes. And you can see both techniques give you NER1 positive, TH positive cells. So while it looked like we were making true dopamine neurons with our old strategy, in fact, we weren't actually, we didn't have the whole story. We didn't have all the signaling process. And that's just really quantified over in B in the top right. And not only were we making the right types of cells with, with this strategy, this four plate strategy, but we weren't making the wrong types of cells. And, and by that, I mean these serotonergic neurons and GABAergic neurons that have actually been implicated in some of the um, problems with uh, fetal grafts. So we have uh, expression of these transcription factors uh, and Lorenz very quickly realized he was onto something. And so they transplanted these cells into several models of Parkinson's disease, uh, rodent models of Parkinson's disease. And I'm gonna talk about one here just to show you the data. This is the 6-hydroxy dopamine lesion uh, adult rat. And you can see these graphs, these beautiful human NCAM positive, TH positive, FOXA2 positive graphs. Uh, indicating again uh, that these are maintaining their midbrain lineage. And importantly, they then went on to show through three different independent tests that when they transplanted these cells compared to sham controls, that the animals actually had restoration of normal behaviors. You're seeing in the bottom left panel K, a complete, uh, complete restoration from the amphetamine induced rotations. Uh, we have a stepping test almost completely towards baseline again. Uh, and then the cylinder test, uh, which is a four limb akinesia test. Uh, and both uh, these stepping tests and cylinder tests, uh, which are pharmacologically independent and uh, more stringent, uh, we have a complete reversal uh, here in behavior uh, significantly. So uh, really what we're showing here is that not only uh, did Lorenzo's group find out that they can make these cells, but they were actually functioning. This was one of these, a uh, functioning long-term. And this is one of the, the problems with some of the other techniques is that they really didn't have this long-term effect. So this is about the time when Dr. Stewart contacted Dr. Cordova and I, and asked us if we would be interested in collaborating uh, on using these cells in Parkinsonian primate models as proof of concept. And so, of course, uh, we, uh, we were very happy to collaborate, and that turned out to be uh, a really good decision and sort of shaped uh, our, our program from there on out. So uh, this is three months post-transplantation into the NPTP lesion Parkinsonian monkey, and this brown staining on the left is human cytoplasm. So anywhere you see brown staining here uh, is a grafted cell, and you can see in B, this is the putamen, this is the target area of the cells. Uh, you see the innervation into the putamen, uh, as well as uh, extensive fiber outgrowth into these white matter tracts in the corona radiata. Now, before we were not, uh, in the studies I'd done previously, I was not able to find TH positive cells. So I was quite happy when I uh, stained for tyrosine hydroxylase and we found a large number of these TH positive dopaminergic neurons within the uh, putaminal graft here. Uh, this is the same graft you're seeing in A. And then, of course, just as importantly, we had maintenance of FOXA2 expression within these cells, indicating, again, they were uh, maintaining this midbrain lineage. Now, it wasn't every single uh, uh, cell that was FOXA2 positive, but the overwhelming majority of them were. And uh, extensive uh, efforts are underway in Dr. Studer's lab uh, to actually uh, purify this population uh, even to an even greater extent. So what exactly do these cells look like morphologically? Well, what I want to point out here, I hope you can appreciate that it's not just one or two cells that are mature or survive. We have large groups of these cells. You can see panel C, we have sort of a network of these cells and uh, they highly innervate the host parenchyma, as you can see in B, with these very long axons. And when you look in detail at these cells at high magnification, you can see in panels D and E on the right, that we actually have this very mature morphology and what we call this sort of angular uh, somata, which is characteristic of midbrain dopamine neurons. And again, you can see a nice fiber outgrowth from these cells. Now, I mentioned before that all we're really trying to do is make this fetal BM cell uh, in a homogeneous manner and in large numbers, right? That was the whole issue with these cells that are very hard to source. So how do these cells match up? This is actual, an actual patient that was in a clinical trial that received fetal ventromesin cephalic cells. And you can see in A, this very nice network, highly innervated cells. And in B, you can see that nice angular morphology uh, within the soma of these cells. And compared to our cells, we actually see very similar morphology of the cells, and we also see this sort of uh, networked innervation. Again, our cells are only at three months post-transplantation. 
So we, when we saw this data, we thought uh, we were quite happy. We thought we were really on the right track. And so the next step, uh, and that we're sort of finishing up right now, is a, a long-term functional study in vivo. This is a one-year study using non-human primate Parkinsonian animals. Uh, and we're really uh, starting now, and Dr. Studer's group, uh, through NYSTEM funding, has really worked on sort of creating this final product, a, a GMP-compatible product from human embryonic stem cells. So we're really excited about this product. Uh, now, one issue that we need to think about when advancing pluripotent stem cell therapy for Parkinson's disease is immune system regulation. So the idea here is that when you have an allograft, uh, you're going to either need immunosuppression, uh, at least short term to some extent, or you have to do something called HLA matching, where you actually match the MHC alleles, uh, very similar to something what you would see in a whole organ transplant. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but that HLA matching would be much more difficult uh, using human embryonic stem cells. Uh, so this is really when I, I became um, sort of interested and in almost, I guess, fixated on using uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. So as you know, iPS cells uh, are derived uh, from individuals, and of course, we can then create different types of cells. Uh, I won the Nobel Prize uh, in 2012, uh, relatively recently considering uh, uh, their inception. And so now I want to focus the rest of my talk on the work I've been doing uh, with Cellular Dynamics International. Now, CDI uh, is a rather innovative company because uh, really what they do is, is they're really good at making uh, not only IPS cells from uh, disease, uh, disease uh, patients as well as healthy patients, uh, but they're also really good at making uh, derivative cells, so heart cells, lung cells, uh, and in this case, uh, brain cells, uh, and for us, post mitotic neurons. And not only are they good at making the cells, they're really good at cryopreserving the cells. And so that's important because when we think about going to the FDA for a clinical trial for something like transplantation and regenerative medicine, the FDA requires you to have a very high level of QAQC on your cells. And so it's important that you can make these cells with high efficiency in very large batches and be able to do all the QAQC and still have enough cells left over uh, and test retest reliability to actually create a therapeutic for a large set of patients. So you've all seen some sort of uh, version of this slide. This is my simplified version of the slide. And basically what we have is we have patient A uh, in blue at the top and CDI uh, basically collects a blood sample. They use episomal reprogramming or what we call this footprint free reprogramming to uh, generate uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. And then of course we can take induced pluripotent stem cells and we can differentiate them into the cell type of our choice. And for us today, we'll be talking about uh, midbrain dopamine neurons. So this is actually the product they call iCell Dopa. You can buy this uh, off the shelf from them right now, uh, any day of the week. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you about some of our, our work using these cells uh, and sort of the right arm of this, of this uh, strategy this, uh, for a cellular therapeutic. I'm not gonna talk today about using these cells as a research tool. However, I will say that they are very nice uh, for use for in vitro diagnostics as well. So there's really two pathways we can look at when we think about cellular therapies uh, uh, for regenerative medicine using iPS cells. One is the sort of the ideal situation, the autologous transplant, that is taking the cell from that patient, deriving the iPS cell line, making our differentiated cell type of choice, and transplanting that back into the patient. Of course, the advantage here is, at least theoretically, you should not need immunosuppression because you have a complete uh, match of alleles in the MHC and loci. Now, the other idea here is an allogeneic transplant, and that's something we call the haplomatching approach. And that is uh, basically you use the exact same procedure that you would use in process for a whole organ transplantation, being that you sort of try and match as many of those MHC alleles as possible to get as close of a match. And so uh, thinking about this, you could take cells from healthy patients where you genotyped them previously, you know exactly what their combination of alleles are, and then you basically pull out the allele combination that matches your patient the best. Okay. And so we're interested in both of these aspects and we're pursuing both of them at the same time. And I think you'll see by the end of the talk how they sort of go hand in hand. So uh, I mentioned these cells, these isol dopa neurons. Well, what exactly are these isol dopa neurons? So this is gene expression analysis looking, uh, this is RT-PCR, uh, looking at these cells at uh, different time points post, post thaw between seven and 42 days. Uh, and that's comparing it in the red bar here being to the human substantia nigra. And I'm not gonna go through all these genes, but just a few I'll point out, FOXA2, LMX1, NER1, TH. Again, these are those genes I've been talking about uh, that are important uh, midbrain neurogenesis genes. And what I want you to appreciate is that sort of across this gene span, 
but they're very similar to what we would find in the human substantiation. So really what this says is that these uh, IPS-derived midbrain dopamine neurons really are expressed in these four-plate and midbrain-specific genes. So the gene expression looks good. Uh, what about protein expression? Well, uh, what do these cells look like in vitro? So on the top left here, you see a bright field image of these cells. This is just seven days post-transplantation. They have these nice, large uh, soma, and they send uh, these axons out uh, all throughout the dish. And these will continue to grow and uh, uh, like I said, they're a very nice in vitro research diagnostic as well. And of course, you can see here, uh, they're greater than 90% FOXA2, LMX1, TH positive. And uh, again, they express TH. I'm going to just do a, a quick fax analysis of these cells for FOXA2 and TH. You see that greater than 75% of these cells are actually co-positive. And that number has actually increased even more as we sort of uh, CDI as we find this process. Now, one of the most important pieces of data I'm actually going to show you today is in the bottom right corner here. That's the thaw viability of these cells. So you might not think that that's really all that important of a piece of data. Uh, but when you think about trying to create this, this cell product and go into the clinic, this turns out to be a big deal. So before I had worked with these cells, I had never seen any uh, post-mitotic dopamine neuron that you could actually freeze and thaw back with, with high efficiency. And so what you're seeing here is around 75% thaw back viability. In our hands, we're usually getting around 80 to 85%. Uh, it really depends on the user. But suffice it to say is you get a large number of surviving cells uh, out of this vial of cells. And so that really becomes important later on when we think about trying to apply this to a patient population. And I'll touch on that in a few minutes. So again, uh, we have this nice gene expression profile, and of course these uh, nice pretty pictures, these uh, immunocytic chemistry pictures. But when I think about protein expression, um, I'm usually sold by Western blots. And so this is just a few of the uh, proteins that we've assayed through Western blots. And what you can see, the, the DA here represents the isol dopa neurons. Uh, GABA here is a highly GABAergic population. That this is actually another uh, IPS uh, line that, uh, IPS derived neuron, neuronal line that CDI cells, the I cell neurons, which are uh, almost 80% GABAergic. And then we have these uh, NSCs, these are the fetal neural stem cells. These are actually Clive Svensson's cortical neural stem cells that we've uh, grown in dopaminergic media. And what I want you to appreciate here is that only these dopaminergic population are FOXA2, TH positive, and you see some of these other genes I've talked about, BMAT2, GERP2 being um, uh, mid, other midbrain markers, as well as having synaptic proteins. So all in all, we seem to have the right gene expression protein, uh, gene expression profile, as well as proteins being expressed in these cells. So that being said, the next question really is, are these cells actually making dopamine? Okay, and so this is an ELISA uh, that was performed on these isol dopa neurons, and as a control, these are isol neurons. That's that GABAergic population I was just talking about. And you can see in blue, this is just the amount of dopamine that's being secreted into the basal media, using this case HBSS. And then we can also apply potassium chloride stimulation and actually get an increase in uh, secretion of dopamine into the media. Again, suggesting that these cells are indeed making dopamine and secreting it. Uh, and we're actually in the process of uh, validating uh, this uh, with HPLC and looking at uh, the metabolites of dopamine, both vanillic acid and dopac. So uh, when I say functionality, uh, of course, most people are going to think electrical activity. Uh, and that, of course, means uh, doing electrophysiology. So we patch clamped onto these cells and you can see in A, we have uh, these cells that are firing spontaneous action potentials. And then in B, when we apply current, they actually also will uh, fire action potentials uh, to and, and fire evoke currents. So it looks like these cells are functionally active. And we take that a step further and we've actually shown that not only are they functionally active, but they actually have very characteristic uh, inhibitor responses uh, to both TTX for sodium channels, as well as TEA for potassium channels. So it uh, really looks like we have functional ion channels. Uh, and there's been a, a quite a bit more uh, electrophysiology and uh, MEA data that's been uh, generated by Kyle Mangan at uh, CDI, uh, as well as in Jim Surmeyer's uh, group by Zhang Zhi. Uh, that we are uh, continuing to pursue, really showing indeed that they have the right receptors and that they're actually are responding uh, uh, in a very similar way to a midbrain dopamine neuron. So I don't have time to show you all that data today. Suffice it to say that at this point, we we're quite convinced that we had the real deal, uh, the right type of dopaminergic neuron, had very high viability post-thaw. And so uh, the next step, of course, and what our group specializes in is testing these 
uh, cells in animal models of movement disorders, in this case, the 6-hydroxydopamine lesion rat and the MPTP lesion primate. And now, uh, all this work I'm going to show you for uh, the rest of this talk has really been spearheaded uh, by these two uh, gentlemen, uh, graduate student David Marmion uh, and a very talented technician, Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Hiller, in our lab, uh, who have really taken on this, this project uh, full bore. And of course, our overall goal here is to figure out whether or not these cells are safe and efficacious to go for an IND approval from the FDA. So now I mentioned the sort of the ideal situation is for a neurosurgeon to be able to call down to a technician in the lab and say, I need X cc's of cells in let's say 30 minutes. And the technician can very easily take that uh, vial of cells thought. Uh, in this case, uh, we actually, uh, Centrifuge, centrifuge and wash those cells twice to remove the DMSO out of the cryopreservative. And then we are transplanting those cells directly uh, at that point. This whole process takes uh, roughly 26 to 27 minutes from the time we take the, that vial out of the liquid nitrogen to the time it is actually being injected into the brain. And so why is this so important? Because these cells do not require any subculture in this data I'm going to show you. Uh, and that's important because we want to really minimize the amount of human exposure and human error that can be uh, introduced into this scenario. Because that remain, that's really what keeps our, our quality, our QAQC, and uh, makes this much more therapeutically viable to treat a large number of patients over a large number of different centers. So it doesn't require any, really any special, uh, any special technical work or any special equipment. So, that being said, what we decided to do was a very simple proof of concept. Uh, at this point, I was very skeptical that this would work. I'd never seen anything like this before. And so we basically transplanted these cells into uh, cyclosporin immunosuppressed regdali rats. And this is just two weeks later. These are, these are intact, healthy rats. And what I think you can appreciate here in A and B are these human NCAM and human cytoplasm grafts that are not only surviving, but they're already innervating the host parenchyma at two weeks post-transplantation. You can see they're also dopaminergic, TH positive, and importantly, they're also FOXA2 positive, as you can see here by co-localization with human nuclei uh, around these TH positive cells. So we were quite happy to find that these cells not only survived and engrafted, but they also maintained their midbrain lineage. So of course, the next step was to see whether or not uh, they were safe. And the FDA, of course, is primarily and most importantly a safety organization. They are uh, very uh, very uh, interested in making sure that you're not going to make patients worse, and thankfully so. So when we think about stem cells, the first thing we think about for safety and regenerative medicine is are our cells proliferating, right? Because the last thing I want to do is make a tumor, a brain tumor, inside of a patient, especially a Parkinson's patient, that's probably going to live for 10 or 15 years at least, uh, in which case even a few proliferating cells could be a problem. And so uh, on the left here, you just see this is the graft zone here in human nuclei. Uh, and then in B, we have our KS67 uh, staining, uh, which stains proliferative cells. And as an internal control, uh, you see in the bottom left panel, B double prime, that's just the subventricular zone and ventricular area, which is where the endogenous neural stem cells are in the rodent brain as a positive control. And I've looked at over 50 animals at two weeks post-transplantation, and I can tell you I have not found a single KI67 positive cell. It was rather hard to believe. In fact, I looked so hard and I thought I finally found one here, you see in B prime in that inset panel where the red arrow is. I thought I finally found one. I said, aha, there is one. And then of course, uh, when I went and looked at high magnification, turns out that was just a piece of dust. It was an artifact from the, uh, from the slide. So uh, not only are these cells surviving, maintaining their midbrain lineage, but it also looks like they have an extremely safe profile and that they're not proliferating. So, we were quite happy with this. And so the next step, of course, was to go into a rodent model of Parkinson's disease. And for us, that's the 6-hydroxydopamine lesion rat. And so the model is quite simple. Uh, you inject the neurotoxin 6-hydroxydopamine into the medial forebrain bundle. That is the bundle of axons that runs from the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra into the striatum where they release dopamine. And when we uh, lesion these animals, what we find is uh, it's a unilateral lesion. So the right side here is the lesion, the left side is intact. And so you can see in the bottom right panel B that all of these substantia nigra uh, midbrain dopamine neurons are completely wiped out. And when we have uh, degeneration of these neurons, we also get subsequent degeneration of their uh, terminals within the striatum. So you can see uh, the lack of TH staining in the striatum as well. Uh, and then from there, it's quite simple. Uh, we actually transplant the cells into uh, the lesion hemisphere and we see whether or not we can actually restore this dopaminergic deficit. Now, 
the way we know if we have a stable lesion is we can actually uh, use this test called the amphetamine-induced uh, rotation test. And so basically what we have is rotational asymmetry in these animals, and they'll actually, once given a dose of uh, D-amphetamine, they will rotate. And if you get re of the cells, uh, the animals will uh, reduce their rotations and normalize and sort of uh, have a uh, zero output. And I'll show, you, I'll show you more of that data later on. But really the important part here is that we're actually able to show that we have a stable lesion and we're very careful in our lab. We do the several test retests over a six to eight week period. Uh, and we have a very stringent criteria uh, for inclusion into our functional studies. So once we had our animals lesioned and we felt like uh, we had the right cell type, we transplanted these cells again. Uh, these are CSA immunosuppressed uh, six hydroxydopamine lesion spread dolly rats. Uh, we let these cells go for six months. And what you can see in C and D is we had very nice survival of both human NCAM and human nuclei positive uh, grafted cells. And I hope you can see on the right hemisphere where we've actually injected the cells, this brown staining all throughout that graft in the, that's innervating the entire striatum, indicating that indeed we have human fibers throughout this, uh, the injected striatum. You don't see that on the contralateral uh, non lesion non grafted site. Uh, and you can see in human nuclei that not only are these cells uh, from our human NCAM surviving and innervating the brain, but the cell bodies themselves are staying exactly where we transplanted them in this graft zone. And that's important because when we do biodistribution studies and we're looking at safety, uh, we really need to know where our cells are at. And it it's always helps when they're not moving around going funny places. So we're, we're actually pretty happy to find that these cells really stay exactly where they were. And you can really appreciate that they're using the human nuclei standing there in the panel, uh, panel B. So uh, the next question really was, well, what about dopaminergic, dopaminergic cells? Are they dopaminergic? And so what we have here on the bottom right, again, we have our uh, grafted cells. This is tyrosine hydroxylase staining, and you can really see now, uh, compared to what I showed you earlier, uh, where we had no, uh, really no uh, dopaminergic fibers, we have complete re of, of the uh, injected hemisphere. And re it's really important to point this out. The bottom left here is uh, that six months, it's that same animal. The substantia nigra is still completely lesion. So it's not like we are rescuing endogenous cells in this process. And it also confirms that we had a complete stable lesion. So I want to just, I want you really to appreciate what I'm talking about when I'm talking about innervation. So this is that same animal I was just showing you. And that was that control animal earlier that I was showing you. This is six months post-transplantation. And all I've done is I've taken these TH images and I've inverted them. So you can really see, uh, really brings out that stain. And so I hope you can appreciate in the top left panel labeled G that we really do have complete re of that striatum, all that uh, blue and, and light stain that you see all throughout the striatum. And that's compared now to the right side where we have the 6-hydroxydopamine lesion control, and we don't see any of that innervation. So this was fantastic. We were really excited about this. But again, uh, our, our job here really is not to have pretty graphs to innervate. Our job is to see if we can actually uh, rescue functional deficits in, in Parkinsonian animals. And so I mentioned this amphetamine-induced rotational test earlier. And so uh, what I want to point out here is this blue line. This blue line are animals that were grafted with these cells that when we actually did the histology on these cells, we found grafts. Uh, some of them were quite large, some of them were smaller, but every single animal uh, had complete restoration uh, of normal behavior, uh, normal rotations, uh, the deficits that we see. And you can see in uh, black is the vehicle control. These are animals that were given a uh, media sham. Uh, I'm sorry, a media uh, injection instead of the cells. And then the red line here, these are actually animals that received a cell transplant and uh, actually when we did histology did not have any surviving graft uh, for whatever reason. And so this is important because you might guess that if your graft did not survive, you should not get better. And that's exactly what we saw. So uh, the blue line actually represents an N of six rats. Uh, the red line is an N of four rats and that black line is uh, an N of four rats as well. So uh, we were, you know, again, we were really happy to see that our histology matched our behavior, right? So if the animal had a graft, and again, it could be a small graft or a large graft, it actually got better. So uh, this is just one test, uh, one functional test we can do. And there's another test called the apomorphine-induced uh, rotation. And uh, while amphetamine-induced rotation really is a, a surrogate for dopamine release, Apomorphine rotations uh, really more of a surrogate for innervation and it has to do with D1, D2 receptors. Uh, suffice it to say, we see the exact same uh, significant result in the animals that had a successful graft versus the lesion or non-successful graft where we have uh, this uh, uh, reversal 
of deficits. And we think that this uh, trend here, you can see it's, it's trending towards baseline. We think this would continue. Uh, and we're, we're looking into this in our long-term studies now. So again, um, this is, these were really fantastic results uh, showing that we could reverse motor deficits using these cryopreserved neurons. And I just wanna stress again that these cells were just thawed, uh, no subculturing, and were transplanted with two very simple washes uh, right back into the, these animals' brains. Uh, and this is six months post-transplantation. So, uh, of course, we're interested in safety, as I mentioned before. So again, I looked at the, uh, these graphs and uh, we found zero Ki67 positive cells in these graphs. Again, you see the subventricular zone uh, as the control. Uh, and then, of course, we uh, wanted to measure the total number of surviving cells and uh, the number of Th positive cells. So in I and J, you can see really the morphology of these cells. They're extremely mature, uh, highly arborized and innervated, sending axons out into the parenchyma. And when we counted these cells, of the total 450,000 that we actually injected into these uh, animals, uh, we saw around uh, 24, 25% on average, uh, ranging upwards towards 30% in some animals. And of those cells presented as surviving cells, about 35% of them were actually TH positive. And this is actually in line, uh, and actually uh, in line or better than uh, other reported groups um, uh, with humans and human embryonic human embryonic stem cell derived cells, and those were non preserved. So again, these results are uh, extremely promising. And so um, we were uh, really happy, and, uh, you know, obviously that we were able to restore function. So the next step then was really to find out uh, what would happen in the diseased environment. So all this data I've shown you so far are using cells from a healthy individual. So this sort of would be that, that, that application, that allogeneic application where we could do a, a haplotype match. But what would happen if we actually use cells from a Parkinson's disease patient, right? So there might be huge differences between deriving cells from a disease patient and how those cells actually go back in. And in Parkinson's disease, what happens over time is these cells uh, in the brain, the dopaminergic neurons develop what we call alpha synuclein inclusion. So, what we're really, really interested right now is figuring out whether or not there are any differences between the two approaches. And this will really inform us how we want to go forward towards the FDA for, for a clinical trial. So right now, and this is uh, work that I'm doing uh, in collaboration with Dr. Deborah Hall in the Rush Movement Disorders Clinic. Uh, we've already uh, started enrolling and actually we're deriving cells uh, from uh, very early stage sporadic Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, so this would sort of be our target population that we would go for. And this is really a proof of concept for the amount of time it would take for us to actually go from the patient back into having a functional cell. And so it's very straightforward. Again, we're deriving uh, using episomal uh, reprogramming, deriving IPS cells, making the dopaminergic neurons, CDIs, then cryopreserving them. Uh, and then we're testing them in animal models of Parkinson's disease. And we've already uh, began uh, the derivation process and differentiation process on uh, uh, two donors, and we now have uh, two uh, more donors lined up um, uh, representing uh, both male and female sexes as well as multiple ethnicities. Uh, so we're really interested in looking again, how do these cells compare? Are there any cross-sex or cross-ethnicity uh, um, differences? To really get, try and get sort of a more universal idea about how our cells uh, will function in animal models uh, towards creating this uh, IND package. So I just mentioned uh, sort of our ongoing experiment with autologous cells. We are taking these cells, uh, all of these cells, and we're going to compare them side by side in a 12 month functional uh, in vivo study. Now this is gonna use aphionic nude rats. So we aren't gonna have to worry about immunosuppressing the animals. Uh, animals really don't respond well to immunosuppression for 12 months. Uh, it can be somewhat toxic and you can have other off target side effects uh, that we don't want to confound our experiments. Again, uh, we're really interested in this autologous versus allogeneic approach. So looking at that haplomatch approach, how do those healthy cells compare versus our sporadic PD cells? Uh, and, and I mentioned it's a functional study. So when I say function, I think about things like elective physiology. What types of action potentials are they firing? How are they firing these action potentials? Uh, really getting in depth into looking at that uh, type of information. And that's being done in collaboration uh, with uh, Dr. Jim Sermeyer at Northwestern. University here in Chicago. And then we're also very interested in uh, really looking at the type of synapses that these cells are making, where, what type of cells they're synapsing on, what type of host cells they're synapsing on to them. 
Uh, and we're really doing that through electron microscopy as well as some array tomography uh, in, in collaboration with Dr. Gan Nicholson uh, and his graduate student, Tim Musial, here uh, at Rush University. So our next step uh, really was, after we had our functional study, was to look at safety and toxicity in vivo. And in this case, we really wanted to uh, look at proof of concept for these cryopreserved cells in NPTP lesion non-human primates. So I just want to very briefly uh, describe to you the NPTP model that I've explained earlier, and that uh, you get this neurotoxin NPTP, and what we have here is a comparison between uh, Parkinson's disease and NPTP. This is a review from um, uh, Collier Labs. Uh, and as well as uh, Jeffrey Cordover at Rush. And what we see is in uh, both the NPTP model and Parkinson's, we have this characteristic loss of dopaminergic neurons within the substantia nigra itself, uh, as well as the loss of striatal dopaminergic transmission, uh, very similar to Parkinson's disease. And uh, just, important, just as importantly, we also get the clinical manifestation, the symptoms, the behavioral symptoms like akinesia, tremor, rigidity, postural instability. So this really is what we call sort of uh, a clinical phenocopy of at least the motor uh, symptoms in Parkinson's disease. And so when we take these cells and we transplant them into to NPTP lesion monkeys, uh, this is one month post-transplantation. You can see the graphs are highly innervated. They're, they're sending axons into the host parenchyma. You can see an A and B. Again, these are just uh, B and C are these, these uh, inverted images so you can really pull out the fibers. And you can see in C, the cells are still somewhat bipolar. So they're kind of immature. And um, we've seen that previously uh, with Dr. Studer cells as well. And what we've also found, as I showed you, at three months, that those cells mature and highly innervate the brain. So what happens at three months? So this is tyrosine hydroxylase staining for these cells. And you can see an, an E and F that not only are these cells maintaining their uh, TH positive expression, but they also have that very nice, large, characteristic angular soma, as well as uh, uh, highly innervating the host parenchyma. And you can see an F in the uh, inverted uh, image on the top right panel there, uh, that very characteristic morphology of these of these differentiated neurons in the high arborization there. So again, uh, we know the cells survive, they engraft, they continue to mature, and they really are uh, expressing uh, the right proteins. We're actually in the process of characterizing these graphs right now. I, I, don't have, I didn't have time to uh, put the data in, but uh, David's just recently, David Marvin has just recently showed me data where indeed they are maintaining their FOXA2 expression uh, and expressing things like VMAT2 and GRP2, which are indicative of the A9 subtype of neuron, which is particularly uh, susceptible to, degener to degeneration of Parkinson's disease. So now, in my last slide, I just want to wrap up here. I want to just sort of show you the global view. Of course, all we're really trying to do again is we're trying to recapitulate normal development, and we're trying to make that cell in the human fetal ventral mesencephalon. Now, by no means has this uh, strategy been um, sort of abandoned. There's actually a group right now that uh, has a clinical trial called TransGero, and their whole a goal for this trial is not to try and bring human, uh, human fetal metromesencephalic grafts back, but to try and learn how to actually optimize this strategy and apply, once we have all the technology figured out for pluripotent stem cells, apply those techniques that they've learned from human VM into the, uh, into the human situation for pluripotent stem cells. I told you about our work with Lorenz Studer's lab that's being funded by the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Uh, using human embryonic stem cells. And uh, Dr. Studer's lab is uh, really spearheaded uh, this, uh, this project and uh, uh, really tackled full, full bore. They have uh, now uh, into their um, pre-IND uh, process with the FDA uh, where they are, uh, they have derived their uh, GMP uh, cell lines uh, that they would need a working cell bank. And, and they've really uh, done a bang up job uh, towards uh, creating a cell type that could be used therapeutically. And then, of course, I told you about our work with CDI uh, that we're working on uh, towards the same ends, again, using the exact same, same type of protocols as uh, Studeries using IPS cells. And the idea here, again, we're trying to, to do an autologous cell therapy uh, and try and sort of get rid of some of that immunosuppression. Now, I'll leave you with this. Which cell type do I think is the best? Honestly, I don't have a clue. The point is to test them side by side and figure out uh, which cell type has the best efficacy. Now for any of these cell therapies to be useful clinically, and this goes for any new, new therapeutic, we're gonna require an enhanced efficacy over the currently available treatments. And for PD right now, that's oral L-DOPA and deep brain stimulation, which show uh, very high efficacy for around 10 years or so. Um, uh, so we already have very well-established uh, therapies for PD. 
So the point is, is not to make something that works as well as these therapies, but to make something that actually works better and creates a more long-term solution. And so I think that needs to, uh, and when we're uh, generating these cell types and we're looking at whether or not we want to use them therapeutically, we really need to keep that in mind that the point is not to do the same, the point is to do better. And so I'll leave you with that. I just went out, I want to thank the people that actually have uh, done most of this work. Of course, uh, I need to thank my mentor, Jeffrey Cordover, uh, who's really um, uh, let me uh, go full at this project and has uh, supported me uh, since he brought me to Rush uh, over five years ago now. And then, of course, these two in the bottom right of this picture, uh, Benjamin Hiller there in the middle of the picture, and David Marmion, uh, who's a very talented graduate student uh, with Dr. Cordover, uh, pictured on the right, that have really done the majority of this work I just showed you, and then a variety of other people from our labs, uh, and then, of course, all of our technical help in the lab. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. And then last but not least, all of our collaborators. I really owe a debt of gratitude to Cellular Dynamics International, particularly the two gentlemen, Chris McMahon, who is uh, the director for the Dopamine Project uh, and really heads up uh, operations at CBI on that end, as well as Carter Cliff, who was the first person I met from CBI that, that really was a champion of this project throughout and, and has been a, a huge help towards getting this uh, to, to the position we're at right now. And then last but not least, uh, Loren Studer's lab and Sonia Cricks uh, really for developing this, this game-changing um, uh, technique uh, and really this paradigm shift towards uh, floor, plate degen uh, floor plate generation of these cells. Uh, without them, uh, we would be uh, still quite a ways away from where we are right now. And then uh, all the people that helped me in graduate school, Gene Redmond, Evan Snyder, my, my PI and mentor uh, when I was in graduate school uh, working with fetal cells. And then last but not least, of course, uh, all of my funding, uh, Rush University Medical Center, CDI, and the NIH. And with that, uh, I would be happy to take questions uh, from the audience. Great, thank you, Justin, for, thank you for that exciting presentation. You know, it was really a uh, great thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, we have time for a few questions. I just want to remind everyone that um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, you can do so now. Remember to just click the green question and answer button that's in the lower left corner of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears and press send. Uh, we'll answer as many of the questions that we can uh, with the time that we have left. Um, so with that, let's get started. So thank you all for your questions. Uh, the first co question comes from um, Maki Ogawa, and I apologize if I pronounce anyone's name incorrectly, from Applied Stem Cell Inc. And I can only see uh, some of this question, but it says, what is the method of differentiation to dopaminergic neurons from iPSCs? Is it different from healthy and PD patient-derived cells? So the method is uh, a slightly modified method from uh, the Studer method. Uh, that being said, CDI does license Dr. Studer's um, protocol and his, his, uh, their IP. So I can tell you it is, is very similar. And all of the tests that we've done uh, uh, using these cells, uh, comparing them has shown that they are extremely similar uh, by gene expression, protein expression, et cetera. Uh, pretty much every uh, uh, parameter we've looked at uh, has really shown that, there's, that they're, they're almost identical. The next question was the PD, sporadic PD cells versus the IPS cells. So I can't answer that quite yet uh, because we're still in the process of deriving those cells. Uh, as most of you know, with any IPS cell line, uh, there's line-to-line -line variability and not only how they're derived, how they grow, the percentage of cells that actually uh, you can differentiate from them. So they're always, uh, no matter what cell type you're using or what um, source you're using, there's always going to be some fine tuning, some tweaking, and that's one of the questions that we're actually really interested in looking at in CDI uh, and Chris McMahon's group has really, uh, is, is really been uh, going full bore into is figuring out just how much tweaking that might take, um, coming up with a protocol or slight modifications of protocols uh, that would uh, decrease that variability. Um, we do know that, uh, that we can create the IPS cell lines from these cells. And we anticipate uh, that there shouldn't be too many issues with the dopaminergic differentiation itself and the crowd preservation. I know there's other groups around the world uh, that have done the same, uh, they use a similar approach and have had success. So uh, I don't anticipate any, any issues there. So thank you very much for that question. That was a great question. 
Um, let's see here. Uh, we have a uh, question from Suji Sebastian. Would the cryostat be repeatable in a real world at a clinic on another continent? Uh, so I, I think you're talking about the actual cryopreservation of the cells. Is it repeatable? It's extremely repeatable. This is not one lot of cells that I'm talking about. Um, cellular dynamics generates these cells all the time. Uh, lots of lot variability is next to none. Uh, they have, a, I can tell you, they have a very strict release criteria, uh, which is something that's very important for scientists like us, right? Because we want to make sure we're getting the same thing every time we use the cells. So that release criteria, not only is it strict, that's a good thing for them because they have a repeatable product, but it's great for us because we know our experiments uh, are not going to change depending on the lot we get of these cells. And I can tell you I have tested multiple lots of these cells uh, in vivo, and I always see the exact same results. And that was actually one of those questions you have as a scientist is, is you know, is this going to be a one-time thing? And the answer to that is it's not. Uh, uh, the next question I see incoming uh, is uh, Shikhar Diao uh, from Irvine Scientific. Have you tested compared DMSO containing versus DMSO free conditions post thaw in your functional parameters? Uh, so the answer to the simple answer to that is no. Uh, we have not tested non DMSO containing uh, conditions, and the reason for that is that um, I'm quite happy with the results we're getting uh, with the DMSO containing cells. Uh, there are other cell products uh, for other diseases using other cell types on the market through other companies that are in the clinic that are cryopreserved having DMSO in them. Uh, the real situation uh, that you need to worry about here is whether or not there's residual DMSO uh, in the preparation when you transplant. And that is something that we can very easily uh, test. We can measure that. And as long as you're underneath uh, that that uh, sort of criteria that you set that's safe that's been set and the, and the FDA has uh, guidelines on that and there's other people that have, that have looked at that uh, then then the prevailing thought is as long as you've done all your safety and uh, safety studies you've shown that it's safe then that's not a problem so uh, I, you know it would I guess it would be interesting from an academic standpoint whether or not uh, whether or not it works without the DMSO uh, we're very happy with our results with the DMSO and we don't think it's going to be a, a roadblock to the clinic. Uh, so I guess for me, it's one of those, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Uh, just be aware of it, make sure it's safe. Uh, and since there are very simple ways to remove the DMSO to uh, a sub-threshold level that we would need for toxicity, uh, that's pretty much been our approach. But that's another great question, thank you. So the next question I'm seeing is from Neil Reiner uh, and the University of British Columbia. What is your best estimate of the timeline for entering phase one clinical trials and what are the major, hur major hurdles to getting there? Wow, okay, that is a fantastic question, uh, Neil. Uh, estimate for timeline for entering phase one. Um, we do a lot of this modeling and uh, looking to try and figure out, you know, what's the minimal amount of time, what's the maximal amount of time. Uh, I wouldn't put any set amount of time on that, and I, and I know that's not answering your question. Um, I would, I'll give you some basic parameters. I would say an ideal situation, if everything works, three to five years. Uh, I think uh, I, and I know uh, CDI, uh, we're very, very concerned with safety and doing it right. Not necessarily being the first person to do it, but doing it right and being able to reach uh, a large patient population. Remember, I mentioned that we'd like to we'd like this to be uh, available, uh, you know, really throughout the world eventually. So you don't need a specialized center or a specialized technician. Um, so estimate for a phase one. I mean, it could be as quick as one or two years if everything went perfect and the FDA was satisfied with all of our preclinical studies. Uh, uh, there's other groups, certainly. Uh, Lorenz Tudor's group is doing a bang-up job right now uh, with their ES-derived cells, uh, really setting the, the bar, I think, for all of us in the PD field. Uh, there are other people in the PD field uh, that have, that have uh, cell products, I think, that are that would be reasonably test. I don't, I don't know as much about them, of course, uh, personally. Uh, there are, there's a group led by Jun Takahashi in Japan uh, that is probably uh, closer uh, to the clinic than some of the rest of us, and he's using IPS cells as well. Now, as far as the major hurdles getting there, I actually have a whole slide on this. I took it out last night 
So I'm sort of regretting that, but that's, that's the biggest, that's the great question. So when you design a clinical trial, especially for regenerative medicine, there are some major, major roadblocks in the way. And when you look at sort of one of these, these timelines, it sort of, it's a cyclical timeline. It's not like a, a, a line by line, um, horizontal line to the clinic. So uh, one thing I've learned in the last five to 10 years working with stem cells and thinking clinically is that you really need to design your clinical trial before you do your preclinical tests. And so um, careful design there will save you a lot of time and in reality, a lot of money so you don't have to repeat yourself. And so what do I mean by that? Well, for any of these cell therapies, and this, I don't care which disease you're working on, this is gonna be the same, your product has to be very, very, very carefully designed. It has to be safe, it has to be repeatable. The QAQC that the FDA wants is extensive, and rightfully so. Uh, that's, that's for all of our advantage. Uh, so uh, this is one thing I think that uh, I really learned and I, and I admire from the Studer Group is uh, their attention to detail creating uh, master cell banks. So these have to be GMP compliant. You need a master cell bank, a master cell bank, a working cell bank. And so when you take these cells and you bank them, that's the cell type, your final product that has all your QAQC that you have to go back and do all your preclinical tests on. So you have to do your efficacy tests in uh, rodent models of disease. You need to do tumor, tumor genicity tests, uh, probably in a large animal model. If you're going to immunosuppress in certain cases, uh, if you need immunosuppression, you're gonna to need to look at the safety profile there. So, uh, you know, again, uh, you, you need safety, and then you need safety, and then you need safety. And um, one always hopes that you're also efficacious as well. But the last thing any clinician wants and anyone, uh, any of us working on this want to do is take a, a diseased patient, someone that's sick, and make them sicker or possibly give them a tumor. That's just not acceptable. So uh, everyone that I know that's working on this throughout the world, whether that be in, in Europe, uh, in Loon, there's a very strong group uh, led by Malin Parmar, um, people like Anders Bjorklund, people like uh, Steve Dunnett, Roger Barker, uh, over in uh, Cardiff in the, in, uh, the UK, uh, Tito, Tito Knuth, uh, all these people, the Japanese group, Jun Takahashi, Lorenz Studer's group, um, uh, they get together uh, once a year actually, uh, and they have a meeting called the G-Force, the PD G-Force, and basically everybody gets together and talks about uh, what they're doing, and, and it's really a, a unique uh, a, a unique approach where everyone that's competing with each other is actually working with each other to some extent so that we, we are learning from each other's mistakes and we're all learning uh, how to get better at this. So it's really a universal good. So that is sort of a long roundabout answer to your question. Uh, I really thank you for that question. It was fantastic. Uh, and and it, it's a complicated question. And I think at the end of the day, what you're gonna see is the people that are doing it right are very systematically going through this process and learning from the FDA what they want. And, and I should probably point out that it's not immediately clear. The FDA doesn't have a set of guidelines where you must do you know, A through Z and we'll approve this. Um, it's, it's, it's different for every application. So great question. Uh, I see another question here uh, from Suji Sebastian from, uh, I apologize if I botched this, Lowbro University. So, do you consider a risk-based approach, EMA-supported, to take the product to clinic? Uh, you know, I'm going to take I'm going to take the roundabout uh, answer on this. So, um, really, my job, uh, as far as, as I'm concerned, uh, as a research scientist, is my job is to test uh, the hypothesis uh, in these animal models of Parkinson's disease. Uh, that's sort of my forte. When it comes to going to the clinic, I really uh, you know, I, I know my area of expertise and I know what areas I'm not an expert in. And one of those areas I'm not an expert in is, uh, you know, actually implementing to the clinic. So we have a lot of different uh, advisors, of course, uh, people that uh, were formerly on the FDA, uh, and this is gonna go for any group. So I really rely on the support of uh, people in, in the pharma industry that have been through this before, uh, people that are other people that are working on cell-based therapeutics uh, and consultants that know how this process exists. And so they can inform me as to how to design my, my uh, basic studies, my, my safety and efficacy studies uh, with the final product and creating that final product. And then, uh, you know, really handing it off to them to implement that. And, and I think one step that, that 
everyone needs to keep in mind is that you need to work hand in hand with your clinicians. Understand who your patient population is. Who are you targeting? What are the symptoms you're targeting? You know, uh, you need to have a, a good working relationship with your neurologists and with your neurosurgeons. And that's one thing, uh, and really the reason that I'm here at Rush is because we have such an outstanding movement disorders clinic uh, that knows how to implement clinical trials. So, you know, really the answer to your question is I, I leave those questions and, and sort of those approaches to the experts in that realm and that domain. And I let them inform me uh, and, and talk, to, talk to those experts uh, who would actually be able to uh, bridge that gap, uh, whether it be uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, biotech, uh, regulatory, uh, or in the clinical realm. So again, uh, a very nice uh, question. So I'm looking at the Q&A and I'm not seeing uh, anything really uh, on the board here. So I think I'd like to thank everyone that attended this conference. Uh, it was a great honor. Thank you to Cellular Dynamics and the Lab Roots for hosting. And again, uh, we're really excited about, about this work here uh, that we're doing at Rush in collaboration with CDI. Uh, and of course, uh, all of our collaborators throughout the world, uh, we're really, really pushing forward uh, to try and help the patients. And at the end of the day, I think uh, that's the key here. That's the goal is to, uh, is to understand that we're doing this for the patients. Uh, so I guess my, uh, I'd like to just finally conclude with thanking those patients, especially uh, our donors uh, that, are, that we're getting those cells from right now um, so we can hopefully try and uh, create a, a better therapeutic for them. So thank you very much for uh, your time. And uh, I think we'll wrap it up with that. Hi. Um, once again, I'd like to just take the, a minute to thank Dustin for his great uh, presentation and for today and hope that um, everyone enjoyed it. Um, for anybody that had additional questions that were not answered, please feel free to contact us at CellularDynamics.com uh, and we would be able to help answer your questions or get you in touch with Dustin to be able to further expand on some of your questions. Uh, one last note, I wanted to let everyone know that today's uh, webcast will be available on demand through uh, viewing uh, through LabRoots for six months from today's uh, date. You will receive an email here shortly uh, letting you know when this webcast will be available. And feel free to share that email with your colleagues who weren't able to join us today. Um, thank you for joining us and we hope to interact with you again soon.